brown when I speak. Can you hear me? Or do I need to move this? That means depends on woman. And so um, I take a lot of pride in that name. And I would like to just start off and give you a, a real brief history of um, Indian women, maybe from about the time of the Wounded Knee Massacre on, because th this is the time that has influenced my life the most. There is a lot of history before that. So, you know, just because I start with the Wounded Knee, knee Massacre, or don't uh, think Indian women were not strong before that time. <coughs> in the late 1800s, I think most of you know about the Wounded Knee Massacre in Wounded Knee, South Dakota. We had uh, 300, over 300 men, women, and children that were massacred by the 7th Cavalry. Uh, they, they were, this is at the tail end of the Indian Wars. So the warriors, the, the people that were strong enough to defend were off anywhere from South Dakota into Canada uh, fighting the U.S. Army. And so the men, women, and children were moving down in from um, up north in North Dakota, South Dakota, down into Wounded Knee. And uh, they didn't have the protection. So when you look at the circle that was there and those that were massacred, that when you hear the term breaking of the hoop, the sacred hoop, that's what that refers to. At Wounded Knee, when the, the women were massacred, when the elder, the medicine men and the elders were massacred, that broke the hoop of our culture. It was the women who passed on the language to the, the children, whether that child be a man or a woman child. They learned, at least from the first seven years of their life with the women, and the wise medicine men or the elders. And so when these people were killed, that broke that hoop. At that time, our culture stopped being passed on in, in the way that we knew, the traditional form of education. And so now you have um, the U.S. government coming in and saying, uh, and the end, I'm sure, I'm assuming most of you know this, this is all related back to the ghost dance, you know, and they're trying to break up that whole thing of, of that spiritual um, togetherness that uh, Jack Wilson had brought up from Nevada to the Dakotas. So that is what Wounded Knee is about, you know, they're trying to break that all up. So then you have the U.S. government coming in saying, we know how to do this, we can civilize these savages, but we have to educate them, like white people. So they established military boarding schools, and Genoa, Nebraska is probably one of the most well-known. And my grandmothers both went to Genoa, Nebraska. And uh, so when they visited, they would say, oh yeah, remember so-and-so. They, they were a captain, or they were a lieutenant in Company B. And, and that's how they, they grew up, knowing that stuff. You know? And um, so you have these military boarding schools now, okay, so the camps, the family camps that were there, you have the U.S. Cavalry going in at gunpoint loading up children anywhere from 3 to maybe 12 years old and hauling them off in wagons to these military boarding schools. These ch the parents didn't see these children from anywhere from 10 to or 2 to 10 years before their children were allowed to come home. When their children did come home, if they did, because very many of them died, they were either beaten or they died of exposure, running away from these military schools. Um, many parents started tattooing their children so they might recognize them again. When they came home after 10 or 12, or two to 12 years, they no longer knew the language. So they couldn't communicate with their families. Their hair was cut, hair is very sacred in our culture. Their hair was cut. They were not allowed to have long hair. They couldn't identify with their families. They were told that the, their families were dirty and backward and, and the whole negative connotations of families started to come into play. So you have this first generation of military boarding school students, Indian students that are removed. So that removes us one step more from our culture and who we are. 
Then you have the next generation of military boarding schools, and we're removed again another generation from our language and from our culture. And then you have uh, the military saying, my God, this is expensive and these kids just won't break. They still have that cultural identity. They still want to speak their language. What is wrong? What are we doing wrong? So you have the churches coming in, and they bid, the Episcopal Church and the Presbyterian and the Catholic churches bid to the uh, United States government and said, we can do it cheaper. We can provide boarding schools for cheaper, but we can Christianize them, and then they will be civilized. So then you have a whole era of church boarding schools. And at this time, you have, from Wounded Knee, maybe four or five generations into boarding schools where parental involvement is not encouraged. Uh, the, the parents are not involved at all in their children's education. And so um, you have a lot of things going on in the boarding schools, the, the rapes of the women. And so you have uh, dysfunctional people coming out of these boarding schools. First of all, they have, don't have that family contact, that, that family um, togetherness and cohesiveness that makes us all healthy individuals. So we have women that are being raped and beat. The men, children, are being raped and beat. So we have a dysfunctional society. But through all of this, Indian women have hung in there. You know, they've been strong. And I would like to just mention my grandmothers. My grandmothers raised me. And, uh, and I have grandchildren. I have two beautiful granddaughters. And, uh, and I hope to have a lot of influence in their lives. But my, my grandmother, my Winnebago grandmother, was Emma Henry Whalen. And she was um, a woman who uh, wore pants, you know, in the 1930s. And that wasn't even accepted. She drove a car, she drove a whole beat up pickup, and that was just, what is wrong with that woman? First of all, she's not from Pine Ridge, she's Winnebago, and she drives a vehicle, you know? And, and so I have a lot to draw from. My grandma Julie, from my, uh, my father's mother, uh, was the matriarch of the family. She, she influenced, you know, we've got probably 40 men in our family, and, and she controlled that. She died in 1988. They both did, in fact, 10 days apart. Uh, but they raised me, so I have an awful lot to draw from, a lot of courage from the history, a lot of the stories that have said, we are survivors, we can do it. And I went to uh, St. Mary's Episcopal School in uh, Springfield, South Dakota, and, and I'm a product of a boarding school, but fortunately the man there, Kenyon Call, was from England and romanticized Indians, so he came over as a missionary, and I had uh, the opportunity uh, because he romanticized Indians. Uh, we had people like Ella Deloria that came to our school for uh, six weeks out of every school year and taught us. We had Oscar Howe that came in for six weeks out of every year after Ella and taught us. So, you know, I had um, a different perspective than a lot of people my age that went to other boarding schools. I was made to feel proud of who I was because of Ella Deloria and Oscar Howe. <clears throat> so, when I graduated from St. Mary's and went on to Augustana, I had a lot of confidence in myself. And there was a lot of stuff going on in 1969, you know, the war, Vietnam War, the protests and stuff. And so we had, um, we started organizing. And, and a lot of my organization carries over from those days, college days, like Judy was talking about. And at Augustana, we had speakers such as Dick Gre Gregory and Julian Bond came in about that time. And, you know, um, there were two schools in Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls College and Augustana, the colleges, and a total of five black students, two at Sioux Falls College, three at Augustana, <laughs> three Indian students at Augustana, none at Sioux Falls College. So we united, and we called ourselves United Soul. Hmm. And we had a little newspaper, and we, we did the mimeograph thing, you know? And there was one morning when we come out into the commons area, and there was a, a black man burning an effigy hanging off of a tree, you know? And, and so we were dealing with that type of stuff, too, and, and got encouragement from people like Dick Gregory and Julian Bond. And um, so we learned to organize from that. Spiro Agnew came in and had a $100 plate dinner you know, when they were going to do the re-election. And so we thought we should make an appearance and disrupt that. 
and we couldn't figure out how to do it because we couldn't get close, you know. So what we done is we had a 25 cent plate hot dog dinner, an anti spiral dinner for 25 cents. <laughs> That was my, my first real involvement in organization when we done that. We went on. Uh, the dating game was a, a daily thing then, if you remember that. Somebody won a trip to Sioux Falls, South Dakota <laughs> for the national premiere of the movie A Man Called Horse. And so we organized a protest against the national premiere of A Man Called Horse. And that is where my FBI fight started. <laughs> so when I, you know, uh, later on I went on into Albuquerque and worked with Jerry Wilkinson, who I have a lot of respect for, um, with the National Indian Youth Council. And he had access to pull our files, and, and he pulled my FBI file. And there was a picture of me at that protest, you know, with a, a hat on going like this. And, and that's, that's how the FBI sees me. <laughs> But anyway, you know, I've, I've had some, some really good experiences in terms of way back in the early 60s, or late 60s and early 70s, in terms of organizing. I've been able to go on, and um, I did become a mother. You know, I dropped out of school because um, that whole system wasn't making sense to me, so I dropped out, had children, and then I went back to school in the early 80s, did my um, undergrad and then my master's. And so, um, in the long run, I did become educated, you know, but not because I sat down one goal and one day and set a goal and said, I'm going to be an educated Indian woman. You know, that happened because I needed to survive and I needed to provide for my children. But the credentials have given me the access I need to be influential on behalf of the Lakota people and Indian people. And later on, when, um, I, I worked at a lone man day school for uh, four years after I moved back home in 1989. And um, I was a facility manager. One day, the BIA uh, gave us the contract. They contracted the facilities management. And they said it will take a year before this contract is approved. And so um, three days later, we had the contract. And we had $100,000 to fix up a, or to operate on a building that had um, deteriorated over 20 years, people not doing their job. And so um, nobody qualified for the job that they advertised, so they appointed me to be their facility manager. And let me tell you, it's ruined my life. I can't go into a hotel or any place without checking the paper towel, <laughs> making sure there's toilet paper. <laughs> but anyway, um, my board that I worked for uh, believed in me enough that they sent me to Washington, they sent me to Aberdeen, South Dakota, where our BIA is headquartered. They sent me into Washington, D.C. Uh, to say what I had to say, that it was a crime that the facilities, the school facilities were the way that they were, you know, just deteriorated. And because of all that, and there's a whole long story to that, it took two whole years, but facilities in BIA Indian schools became a national issue because of the leeway my board gave me. And, and now you see the BIA is, is looking toward facilities and what they can do to correct that. And I'm, I'm very proud of that because we had buildings caving in on kids sitting in classrooms, you know, and uh, you just can't feel safe about your child in a building like that. Um, my most recent uh, involvement with my community at home has been stopping a solid waste dump out in our community. They, uh, somebody, I come from the poorest county in the entire United States, Shannon County. We have a per capita income of $2,700 per year. Most of that is food stamps and ABC payment income. So we are very poor people. And somebody in our community decided, because we are so rural, that if we had the solid uh, waste site for the reservation, we could employ people out there. Well, they didn't even come and ask those of us who live there. And I live in a very rural area. I have no electricity, and I still haul my water. And so, you, you know, it, it took a lot because uh, I probably could have gotten electricity if that dump site were out there because they would need electricity to do some of their uh, grinding and all the stuff that they do. But we stood up against that, and we organized uh, community people that uh, 
uh, really didn't ever say their name to another group of people before because we're very rural and everybody lives in, on their own land. And uh, these community meetings have brought us together. You know, that community, there's probably about 60 people out there on maybe a, a 600 um, mile area there all together. And so, so we're very sparsely populated. But these people have taken pride in the fact that they chose not to have a solid waste dump. And we had to go through that whole process of first of all organizing our community, electing our community officers, drafting a community resolution to take into our district and having our district um, adopt that as their resolution and taking that into tribal council and then going into tribal council to speak. Um, and, and we had about seven elders that went in with us, you know. And um, now the tribal officials, when they see me, they just go, oh. <laughs> and, and so they're used to me. But it was real exciting to have these other people come in and be a part of that, to be learning that. And um, uh, we did stop it. And they feel pretty good about that. And our community meetings are going on. So we, you know, I just wanted to share with you some some of the background, the issue that we're dealing with right now is gaming. Uh, I am the new human resource director for the Prairie Wind Casino, which is going to be the new casino for the Pine Ridge Reservation. And um, we have what we call implied consent, which means if a, if a non-member comes to our reservation, a non-member Indian comes to our reservation, or a non-Indian comes to our reservation and they're arrested, they have to give consent in order to be prosecuted by our tribal court. So we have that in, in our uh, gaming compact with the state, the tribe gave up uh, jurisdiction over non-member Indians in exchange for 80 gaming machines so that they would be able to support uh, the $4 million complex that they're building. Well, some of the tribal members, it's election time for us. Uh, Tuesday will be our election. We'll determine who our, our elected officials are for the next two years. And so somebody used that as a campaign tactic that the tribe has given up sovereignty because of this. But, you know, if, if you have implied consent, it's the same thing. That person has to agree. So and it's really mute, except somebody has made it a political issue. And so one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm going wherever I can go, and I'm saying jurisdiction and sovereignty are not the same thing. First of all, sovereignty is tied to a land base. Okay? You have to have land in order to be sovereign. The next thing is, because of the poverty on the reservation, our food stamps come from the state of South Dakota. The state welfare checks come from the state of South Dakota. So South Dakota controls our economy. As, as pitiful as it is, they control that. The next thing is, South Dakota State Social Services can come in and remove our children. The biggest resource that we have is our children, and yet they can come in. Now to me, that's jurisdiction that we need to be on top of as Indian people. We need to be questioning that, not, not gaming. You know, that whole issue becomes mute. But because our people are, are undereducated or not educated at all, uh, this has been used as a scare tactic. And so um, I'm, I'm on the blacklist for state social, <laughs> social services. Uh, welfare and food stamps because I've been going around talking negatively about them. But that's who we are as Indian people. If, if we can get people to understand what we're working toward, and that's what community action is all about, that we all share that same vision, that we all try to accomplish that same goal. And so that's kind of what I'm doing right now. And I know I, I told you just about five minutes, so I'll cut it short so we can get on with questions. I just want to say that Sonny's resume does not say everything. <laughs> uh, if anybody cares to start. I just have a question, a point of clarification. Are you saying that, that the casino issues are really a distraction from the real, the more important issues of gaining a jurisdiction or more control over your children so that social services can act? I'm, I'm saying that there, there are people that are saying because the state, the, the tribe has accepted 80 more gaming machines 
and said we will we will not prosecute non-Indian members. What that means is those people then go into the county courthouse, but that is not reservation wide. That is in the casino only. If, if somebody from Rosebud comes, a, a non-tribal member from our tribe, but from another tribe, comes onto our reservation and cheats at cards or, or breaks up the slot machine or something, only in the gaming establishment. They would then be hauled off to the county court rather than to tribal court. If that same person came onto the reservation and broke into our tribal grocery store, they would be prosecuted in tribal court. So it's a mute issue. We have implied consent. It has to be up to that person anyway. Do you want to be tried in our court or not? But somebody has taken that and blown it out of proportion and scared people. The tribe has given up jurisdiction. The tribe has given up sovereignty. And sovereignty is not connected to a, a gaming machine. It's connected to the land. So they can't give up sovereignty. They can give up jurisdiction. But my, my point is, is if they're concerned about jurisdiction, then why the hell aren't they looking at social services who can come in and take our kids? Or the people that control the economy there with the food stamps and the welfare. Even our commodity program is a state program. That is not a tribal program. So if they're concerned about jurisdiction, they need to be looking at the, the political issues of that. And, and not falling in and being sucked in by that scare tactic that is being used. Questions? I'm Robin Blunt. And last week, I think it was last week, last week's New York Times magazine, I think, I was reading an article about the uh, sort of spread of casinos as a uh, reservation business throughout the United States. And one of the points, if I understand it, the gave me the article that um, because of tribal culture in many tribes, the money made to this gaming would be divided among families and people who do not even, they're not even employed at, at the casino. The author, and I, I don't know how I, 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 I'm, I'm not presenting myself in agreement with the author, but the author of the article said that this did not allow for um, a massive capital to create more diverse industry bases um, to diversify the basis of employment, um, and, and therefore, it, it, in the end, we not reach the tribe. And I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, the Oglala Lakota is the second largest tribe in the United States, so we're about 20,000 people population. So when you look at gaming on reservations that have 400 members, that per capita payment that does go back to them. Um, you know that does happen for those tribes, but for our tribe, it will never happen unless we, you know, we get one or two dollar checks. Right? And so our tribe has established um, with the the management company right now, where the the tribe would get 70 percent of all profits, and the management company would get 30 for the first three years. And on the the last two years of the management contract, you would have 70 um, percent for the tribe. 25 for the management company and 5% going back into our nine uh, geopolitical districts. And so, um, you know, I, again, what might apply to other tribes wouldn't apply to us. The 70% that the tribe is taking for each of those five years is earmarked for specific uh, things such as education, um, elderly recreation and housing, uh, those types of things. So that will come back to the tribe and be administered in, in the way that the tribe has determined and not by individual tribal members. Is there a question back here? My name is Carl Peterson. And Judy, I'd like to direct this to you. In your talk, you mentioned that you had the vehicle of SNCC to <laughs> I got off the old blades and got the good
Um, I guess, let me, before I answer your question, let me just mention also, um, I was interested in hearing your talk because it's interesting, every time I, I, I recently heard Thelma Mantle um, talk about, yeah, from the Navajo Nation, and Oklahoma, okay. but Cherokee. 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 Okay, Cherokee. Um, and how interesting it was, and it relates somewhat to the question you raised. Um, because one of the things she talked about, and it's interesting, some of the similarities. Um, because it wasn't just that you take away, that you take away the means of surviving, but you also in part of trying to break the spirit, you also try and break the spiritual connection that one has to the other. Um, and so when she was talking, Thelma Mankiller was, Chief Mankiller was talking, she was talking about how um, she had people coming on the reservation, um, uh, Native American um, advisors, who would come on with specialists in various things um, to fight, figure out what to do about where the young people were going and the high alcoholism rate and the this and the that and all the things that were killing them. And she said, and it was something that really rung a chord with the African Americans in, the, was, um, in Cambridge in, in, you know, um, in Massachusetts. And she said, what was interesting is that I thought they were going to talk about the bad education and the, and the, you know, and the alcoholism and the, you know, the poor housing. And what they talked about instead was the spiritual degeneration and how we had to figure out, and I'm not talking about this coming from, you know, because I'm not a church person, so, but how, what has happened to us as a people, and how you begin to get, see, black folks have always been um, poor, you know, there's always been a black middle class, but there's also been a poverty within that. But we also always knew who we were and had a sense of self within that. Um, that there were families, that there was caring, that there was a support structure that allowed for that. And um, I think one of the things that I think about, I mean, when we were organizing SNCC and we were going into communities, we were going into communities that still had an infrastructure. Now, it wasn't always a, um, a wealthy infrastructure. It wasn't always even a middle class infrastructure. But there was something that you could hold on to that these kids were coming out of. And I think, I mean, it, it, it reminds me of the fact that I was, for example, on a subway in New York City. And I still have an apartment in New York. And a couple of years ago, um, I heard this young black guy who started talking um, to this other friend of his um, about women in a way that was absolutely amazing to me. Um, I mean, it was like it was gutter talk. And so I went over to him and I said, excuse me, brother, you're not in the locker room. And he said, oh, excuse me, excuse me, right. Now, if I, as I sat down back to my seat, um, an older guy whom I did not know looked at me and said, you're not from here, are you? And what he meant was, for that kind of thing now, you can be killed. Now, that has nothing to do with the, the still ever-present racism or the poverty or all that. It is that there is, a, there is something that is happening that we now have to reclaim. And I guess what I'm thinking about is how do you begin to get organizations? And, and, and I, what I'm beginning to see is something that is beginning to happen, which is that you're getting, for example, rites and passage programs in a lot of communities. You're beginning to get mentoring programs. You're beginning to get people who are trying to form organizations that not only talk about tutoring and talk about um, achievement and how you have to be responsible one for the other, but that you're talking also about how do you begin to get centered within yourself so that you don't dehumanize yourself and your community in the way that that's beginning to happen within our community. Um, and I think that that's going to be as important as dealing with the fact that this country seems to have given up on public education, and particularly within um, poor and people of color communities. Um, and that, you know, that the ceiling is just constantly there for us. But, but also, how do you as a community begin to reclaim that thing that used to make you go forward, even knowing all the racism that was going on, even knowing all the stuff that was out there? Um, and that's the thing that I realize is more difficult. Now, what I usually say to people is, particularly young people, because when you talk on campuses, what you get particularly now is a lot of folks who are saying, I really want to figure out how to do it. But either, you know, a lot of folks are still apathetic or I don't know what to do and where's the national movement. Um, now, there is some version of national movement for young people. I think, um, as a matter of fact, Marion Wright Edelman's um, son, uh, she's, you know, you know, the children's defense son. But 
her son recently graduated from Yale and just started with some other African American young people who are coming off of campuses, what is called the Ella Baker Institute, which is wonderful. And they're now in their third year and they're doing training based on the SNCC model. And they're involving about 200 young people who have come off these campuses, again doing work within communities. But in addition to that, my main problem is that people should, particularly young people, should not wait until there's another national movement, that you really got to organize where you are. Sometimes it's tutorial programs, that that should not be seen as a low rung on the totem pole. That yes, that's very important. Again, because we, I mean, see, I could come out of Sleepy Hollow High School and I knew that I was going to get a basic, good education. That is not true anymore. And so, somehow we've got to figure out how those of us who have education go back into those communities and start passing some of this along. And that that is as important as some of these national movements that are going on. Um, so my thing, my message usually to young people is that, yeah, you got to start, you know, as Booker T. Washington said, put, putting your buckets down where you are and, and, um, and that you just don't wait for this other larger piece, I don't think, anymore. Um, but. I saw a lot of hands earlier. <laughs> I was very interested in your, um, the last speaker that you referred to, the stages that she was going through. Could you repeat that name for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, she. It's her name is uh, Melba Patillo. Uh, she's one of the Little Rock Nine. It's in a book that we did called Voices of Freedom, and it's uh, on Bantam. It's in paperback, and it's uh, done. The names on it are uh, Henry Hampton and Steve Thayer, F-A-Y-E-R. And it's a compilation of transcripts from the 14 hours of Eyes on the Prize. It seems like in many ways, me relating to the previous question, that's kind of what we're at in many ways today with many of the social movements. We're trying to uh, pass the fight back into a don't care mode. Because mm -hmm. what, 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 it's hard to define exactly what needs to be done next. Um, it's sort of a transformation, perhaps, that has to come as we learn different organizing our communities. Mm -hmm. That was very helpful. Mm, good. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to kind of say something too along those lines. Um, I think a lot of it involves restructuring what was in place a hundred years ago. When you look at uh, the Lakota and even, even the Winnebago societies, um, or they had societies, there were secret women societies. They had women that had a tattoo right here in, in the Omaha and, and Winnebago societies that signified that they belonged to a certain group. There were women that wore their hair a certain way or, or a particular identification piece in their hair that, that when need arise, arose, that they, they came together because they belonged to the secret society. There were societies for the Lakota men, the Akichita, the warrior societies. There were societies that were for just the crafts and, and the artwork. So everybody had a sense of belonging to something. And, you know, like with the gang springing up all over. Um, to me, that's a replacement for that society. Uh, people don't attend church like they used to 20 or 30 years ago where you had those institutional controls in place. And so I think those societies for us as Indian people need to be reestablished. Hmm. Sonny? I'm Sonny. Um, we talked about your community and how poor it is and so forth. And we have a lot of color and so it's like, what do you, uh, do you have any ideas of how to change, you know, the, the economic structure for your community? The economic structure for our community would probably go back into our tribe. I, I think the casino is a good start. When you look at what has happened on other reservations that um, are as poor or nearly as poor as we are, um, it gives the tribes that move away from the federal government where we can have our own money. We have been made to become dependent on the federal government and the Bureau of Indian Affairs is a paternalistic organization that um, is, is just now changing. You know, uh, 30 years ago, uh, the superintendent was usually a non-Indian person, and he was assigned to the tribal council as the fifth member. 
Um, by the way, I didn't mention I come from a very political family. My father is uh, Richard Dick Wilson, who was mm. tribal chairman uh, during the turbulent 70s for our tribe, and he was the only person in the history of our tribal elections to serve two consecutive terms. So he had four years, and so you know you can do more in four years than you can in two years. But because um, I come from that political family, and in our tribal structure, we have um, uh, tribal leaders who defer to that family history of politics, and so we have access to speak on the council floor and uh, things like that. So we can uh, work with a lot of the individuals. Um, one of the things is, as we move away from federal monies and um, start getting into uh, individual tribal business ownership, I think that uh, things are going to start changing. From, from the um, casino itself, uh, the management company has decided they will manage the casino, that it should be up to other tribal members to establish the motels, the restaurants, the craft shops um, that will go with that. And so that, um, that the money coming in can go in a lot of different directions and not just belong to the casino. Can I just ask a question up? Sure. Because it seems to me that venues, which is interesting to me, that the basis of it, though, is a cooperative economics. Right. How do you maintain that in the midst of all this? <laughs> we, we have a, a, you know, like a, a pedagogy of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. That whole thing, you know, where, where uh, we have the Lakota Fund now, which is funded by Cowlock Foundation, um, that will lend uh, tribal members up to $25,000 uh, to start businesses. But the, they were originally established to um, help Indian people without uh, money experience or small business experience pass that whole bank loan process. They've, they've actually doubled it because now you have the bank process and their process. You know, so, so um, you, just looking at what we can do better and, and saying to Kellogg Foundation, this isn't working. Even if it means losing your money, it's not working for us. You know, and having the courage to say that and, and to say what will work for us. And I think it's got to start there. Has the casino helped, I'm Mary Salt, helped at all in dealing with the problems of, uh, well, despair and suicide and alcoholism or has there no relationship between uh, our, our casino is going to open April 7th. So for our reservation, I, I can't yeah. say that yet. But for a lot of reservations, um, the impact has been um, incredible. You always have a couple of people that will, will become addicted. You know, and, and there is that concern. We have a group called the Gray Eagles. And by the way, we have interest groups that we didn't have 20 years ago, 10 years ago. We have environmental groups. Uh, we have uh, veterans groups that are organized. And, and the Gray Eagles are elders. And um, so they're organizing. And they're bringing up those concerns. And in fact, um, they keep us on our toes because they are against the gaming. Uh, for the very reason that they think that um, all of the people are going to become addicted to gambling and they'll be stuck babysitting the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and, and so we've set up community meetings and, and we try to go there and address their concerns. There's been um, a suggestion from them that uh, the casino establish a child care center. And um, I think that would be a good move for the employees, but I don't think the management company can get into providing uh, daycare for the gamblers themselves. I mean, that's something else. If, if the tribe is that concerned about it, the tribe needs to establish a daycare center, you know. And, and so we're working through those things, but, you know, they bring up all of the things. Um, they're saying things like um, uh, there may be suicides. A lot of people could become addicted. What are we going to do with them? We want a plan in place right now. We want a portion of that 70% that goes back to the tribe to be delegated or designated uh, for Gamblers Anonymous. You know, but the way I feel about it is uh, we haven't even dealt with the alcohol problem. You know, so, so we need to de do that more effectively. And we have a high alcoholism rate. We, as much as our unemployment, which ranges from 80 to 95 percent, fluctuating both the unemployment and alcoholism rate usually run parallel. 
to know that there's a lot more to be concerned about. And I think um, one of the very exciting things for me is um, we brought in the first group of people to be trained, which is the card dealers, on February 9th. And uh, they're now in a six-week training session. We started with 43 people, and we have 43 people right now. You know, and so people want to work, and I and I think it's going to be a great group. A lot of people don't have the work experience, and it's heartbreaking to see their applications. And, and uh, for their experience, it's JTPA or TWEP, you know, tri Tribal Work Experience Program, uh, Job Training Partnership Act. Um, some of those programs that are basically subsidy, uh, they've, they've been around for 20 years or so, but this is the first time our tribe is going to be able to pick up permanent employment after they're trained, after they spend their thousand hours training. You know? So I think that's real exciting, not only for us, but for them. because I'm, I'm beginning, to, I'm an optimist too. Um, I think it's the only way that you, you're in it for the long haul. Otherwise, you just throw it up and you know, go live in a forest somewhere. But um, I think probably, for me, it is that I'm beginning to see this um, return to some of the problems for, for us in the inner city. Um, they really are beginning to see a lot of uh, men's groups, for example, 100 black men, um, 100 black women also. But, um, some of the Greek organizations, some of the, the which are going back in and trying to reestablish that kind of um, training program and sense of hope and and also putting some pressure now on some of the school boards to actually teach the kids. Um, um, you're beginning. I'm even seeing in within the inner cities. I mean, even with the gang peace thing. Um, and I don't mean to romanticize that because I think there is. I mean, there's some folks who, at, by the age of 20, really. I'm not sure how much you're going to change them, you know. But um, and yes, they are very, very bright, and and in another time would have been leaders of their community. But I'm not sure whether you're going to be totally able to turn them around after a certain point. But we'll see. Um, but I do think that you're, you're beginning to get some effort to like with the game piece. I mean, some of these folks who are coming in and now, um, even though it means a real loss of income, are beginning to to start to do other things. They're going back to school. Um, um, and are reconnecting in some ways with society. And it's because there are some other things for them. It is that sense of community that maybe is being put in place in some other ways outside of the gangs. Um, I don't think it's going to happen unless we figure out how to give folks jobs. I mean, I just don't. Um, you know, you, you can't just continue. But see, my father growing up, he could have a high school education and go to the plant. He didn't need college. He didn't, I mean, he didn't, need, didn't really need the high school diploma. Um, you can't do that anymore. Fish your body, the clamp tire down, is shut down, you know. And so um, the kind of low-scale jobs that people keep talking about, you know, they're not going to, you can't just work at McDonald's. So it's like, how do you begin to then start talking about a real jobs program and a real training program? And, um, um, and this is one of those things where I think it's, be, it's not just then uh, local effort. You really do have to start applying pressure. And that, um, you know, folks at the top have got to know that, you can't just do this kind of half half half, um, half stuff. You, know, you can't. <laughs> you got to be serious about it. And I'm not sure whether that's happening yet. And, and I would think, along with that, we have to um, 
emphasize the spiritual side more because I think that's where the answer is and especially for Indian people when we look at our traditional ceremonies and we never had a religion we had a way of life that was practiced every day not on Sundays and so the return to that to give people the strength and and um, you know like uh, Judy is talking about 20 years ago you could get your kid a $10 pair of tennis shoes and it lasted a while. Now you're paying $120, $130 for tennis shoes. <laughs> you know, they could tear up in two or three weeks. So, so that whole change there. And also um, materialism. I, I think when we uh, develop more of the spiritual, we will move away from the materialism. Uh, and, and I've tried to share that with my family by saying, uh, just because I'm working on a doctorate doesn't mean I can't haul water. You know, so we haul water, and, and we're pretty self-sufficient with propane and propane lights and stuff, but we don't have electricity.